Chapter forty one of Carpenter's Geographical Reader Asia by Frank Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Tibet and the Tibetans. Tibet is the most elevated inhabited region on earth. It is so high up in the air that the Hindus call it the roof of the world. It consists of an immense plateau about one eighth the size of the United States which is upheld between the himalayas at the south and other high mountains at the north the greater part of it being more than two miles above the level of the sea this lofty tableland is crossed by mountains and it has some parts which are more than three miles in height it has both fresh water and salt water lakes the mountains about it are the sources of the mekong hoang and yangtze and also of the brahmaputra and the indus the country is stony and rough and a great part of it is as arid and sterile as the desert of gobi which lies farther north as the warm winds of the indian ocean blow against the high cold wall of the himalayas they are laden with moisture but the cold condenses this and it falls as rain or snow so that when the winds blow north of the mountains they are comparatively dry indeed tibet is in places almost as dry as the sahara although its mountains are covered with snow for the greater part of the year in the short summer the valleys and plains are hot and as the winter comes on the weather grows so dry that the leaves on the trees wither and may be ground to powder between the fingers planks and beams crack and break and the people sometimes cover the woodwork of their houses with coarse cloth to preserve them the dryness of the air is such that salt is not needed for the keeping of food fresh meat can be left out of doors without spoiling the air sucks up the juices and the meat can be powdered like bread as soon as a sheep is killed it is skinned cleaned and hung up out of doors it quickly becomes a dry stiffened mass after which it may be kept a long time but what kinds of animals do they have on this high cold plateau there are donkeys sheep goats and yaks there are also horses and ponies and wild asses wild sheep and antelopes one species of antelope known as the chiru has a pair of long slender horns which extend almost straight upward from the crown of the head in front of the ears there is also a monkey which has a snub nose and long thick silky hair there are yaks wild and tame the yak is sure-footed and strong and it is sometimes used for carrying burdens over the mountains it is about as large as a good-sized cow and in some respects looks like one it has horns and hoofs and its body is covered with a thick coat of hair which in places is several inches long the yak's tail is more like that of a horse and is sometimes three feet in length it has a hump upon its shoulder which is composed largely of fat another tibetan beast is the musk deer from which comes the scent called musk this animal is smaller than any deer we have in america the musk is found in a little ball of fat enclosed in a sack beneath the skin of the abdomen the fat is of a dark brown chocolate color and it looks much like moist gingerbread when the deer is killed the fat is taken out and dried it is then shipped over the mountains to india or china and thence to the united states or europe where it forms the basis of many perfumes the people of tibet number more than six million they are mostly stock breeders and farmers they have irrigated patches in the valleys and raise hardy grains they have mines of gold salt and borax and also some of the finest turquoises known to the world the tibetans are exclusive and they do not like to have foreigners come to their country for centuries they kept all strangers out and it was only a few years ago that the british forced their way into the capital the city of lhasa and made a treaty with them by which trade could be carried on they acknowledge themselves to be subject to china although for the most part they are ruled by their lamas or priests of whom more is told farther on in this chapter these people are of the mongolian race and they have their own language they look much like our indians having high cheekbones and dark yellow or copper-colored complexions the men have no beards to speak of and all carry pincers to pull the hairs out of their faces the tibetans are divided into tribes each of which has its own customs 
although all dress much alike they have gowns which reach from the neck almost to the ankles and are tied in at the waist with girdles of wool in the winter they wear either sheepskins with the wool turned inward or so many furs that it is hard to tell where the furs end and the bodies begin the summer clothing consists of native woolen cloth the tibetans are fond of bright colors and especially of reds purples and blues both men and women wear boots made of red or yellow leather held up by garters attached to their tops in northern tibet the people have caps of cloth or felt trimmed with lambskin which come to a point at the crown these caps are sometimes covered with silk and they may be green red or blue in some sections of the country they have high hats shaped much like that of a korean gentleman but with a broader brim and a larger crown the brim is often faced with red silk the hat is tied on by a string around the throat both men and women are fond of jewelry the men frequently wear in the left ear an earring set with pearls and turquoises and often two inches long the women have chains of gold silver and copper about their necks they also wear earrings some of which are so heavy that a little strap is tied to the ring and passed over the top of the ear to take the weight from the lobe they adorn their hair with jeweled trinkets plating gold silver amber and coral in their braids and how do the tibetans live some of them have tents made of the coarse hair of the yak and others rude homes of wood or stone the latter being laid up in clay mortar most of the people live in villages there are only one or two towns which might be called cities the chief being lhasa the capital in the larger places we may find houses of three stories the homes of the rich they are built around a court and each of them may contain several rooms the poor man's house is seldom of more than two stories with a courtyard in front or behind it the ground floor is sometimes used as a stable there are very few windows in the houses except holes in the walls which may perhaps be covered with oiled paper fireplaces are used for cooking but there are no chimneys and the smoke must get out as it can the principal fuel is dried yak manure and this is so scarce that the cooking fires are expected to keep the house warm the tibetans live largely upon barley wheat beans and peas which they crush and grind into a meal and cook as a mush or in cakes they are fond of raw meat and seldom serve their meats more than half cooked they eat the flesh of yaks camels and hogs and like most people of cold climates are especially fond of fats a favorite dish is a soup of brick tea butter and water cooked into a thick fatty broth after this mixture has been taken from the fire some barley meat is added and it is churned in a little tea churn the broth which has now become a thick mush is ladled out in bowls and the people knead it into balls with their fingers before eating it both men and women are fond of tobacco which they carry about in horn boxes much like the powder horns of our colonial days all the men smoke and the priests and women take snuff these people are very religious they are buddhists and are largely ruled by the buddhist priests or lamas of whom the land has many thousands at the head of the priesthood is the grand lama who dwells in the potala a temple just outside lhasa he is usually a boy who is supposed to have the spirit of buddha within him the tibetans spend a great deal of their time in praying to buddha and they have machines of various kinds to multiply their prayers one of these is the prayer wheel a cylindrical tin or brass box which whirls around a stick or pin through its center a number of prayers are written upon a strip of paper and this is wrapped around the stick inside the box as the man rubs the stick between his palms the paper whirls and he believes that at every turn of the wheel he will have the credit of making as many prayers as there are on the paper large prayer wheels are often turned by the wind and sometimes by the waters of a creek or brook in such cases one has to only pull out a peg and the wind or water prays for him wiping away sin after sin so the tibetans think as long as the water flows or the wind continues to blow nearly all education in tibet is confined to the priesthood 
and the tibetan books are almost altogether religious ones among the queer customs of this country are those related to marriage instead of having several wives as is common in some asiatic countries the tibetan has only a part of one wife when a girl marries she often becomes the wife of all her husband's brothers or she may marry one or two extra men so that she has four or five husbands in such cases she is regarded as the head of the family and does most of its labor she cooks weaves and knits and also works in the fields in the towns nearly all the shops are kept by women and woman is the bread earner as well as the bread maker nevertheless she does not think that her fate is a hard one for a rich tibetan lady of lhasa once said that she pitied the women of other countries who were so poor that each could have only one husband but before leaving we must take a look at the city of lhasa it is the capital of tibet and the centre of its religion government and trade the people make pilgrimages to it and until recently they forbade all strangers to enter it on penalty of losing their lives it has now become more accessible however and we can find out how it looks it is not a large city containing at best not more than twenty five thousand people it lies in a plain called the plain of milk but we think it should be named the plain of water and mud for it is surrounded by swamps and is reached only by a roadway built through them the plain is about fifteen miles long and from two to five miles in width there are great mountains about it the peaks of which even in midsummer are covered with snow as to lhasa itself it is a town of palaces and hovels there are many rude one-story and two-story houses of stone cemented together with clay and larger ones of granite solidly built some of the homes of the priests have roofs washed with gold about two-thirds of a mile from the city of lhasa is the potala the great temple home of the grand lama this is a group of buildings which looks like a fortification it stands upon a rocky hill rising above it higher than any church steeple it is nine hundred feet long and has enough rooms to house hundreds of the grand lama's servants and about five hundred monks the grand lama's home is in the centre of the temple he is so sacred that he is seldom seen by any one but his servants and priests most of whom get down on their knees when they enter his presence the grand lama rules by the direction of advisers appointed by the chinese government of which country tibet is a dependency there are chinese soldiers at lhasa and chinese officials at the principal places and we meet chinese merchants and traders as we go through the country the chief foreign trade of tibet is with china and india goods are carried across the mountains on camels or yaks and are sold at the market towns upon the frontier the people import brick tea cloth and notions of various kinds they export wool cattle borax salt and also turquoises and gold so far most of the country has not been explored and it may have mineral riches of which we know nothing End of chapter 41chapter forty two of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b afghanistan leaving tibet we return to india and take a long railroad ride across the great plain to lahore and north to peshawar at the entrance to the khaibar pass which leads into the wild country of afghanistan we have secured permits to enter this land from the amir its monarchical ruler and he has sent out a company of soldiers to guard us on the way to his capital our travels are through the grandest of mountain scenery the snowy peaks seem even higher than those about darjeeling and many of them are really three or four miles above the level of the sea we climb slowly over one awful pass after another now skirting precipices many hundred feet deep and now crossing deserts of sand and valleys covered with rocks we see irrigated fields here and there and occasionally some patches of trees on the mountains we cross raging streams go through long winding gorges and climb over places so high 
that we have to frequently stop and rest on account of the thinness of the air at last we come down into a green fertile valley in which the many cultivated fields and orchards of fruit trees are separated by a network of ditches through which cool water flows we ride for some miles in this valley and finally reach kabul the capital of afghanistan kabul is situated in the hindu kush range on the banks of a river which flows out of a gorge in the mountains the city is about a thousand feet higher than denver and it has nearly the same number of people the afghans are mostly mohammedans and therefore their houses are surrounded by walls so that we cannot look in as we walk through the streets the houses are usually of only one story and the best have many rooms connected only by doors and without halls or passages they have gardens about them and orchards loaded with fruit the business part of the city consists of bazaars the streets through which are so roofed as to keep out the sun the main roads run out from these bazaars in four directions they are badly paved and have no modern improvements during our stay in the city we meet many of the people they are of different tribes and have very queer costumes the men wear turbans and gowns and nearly every man we see carries a gun or a sword there is a great difference of conditions some of the people are rich and powerful and others poor and oppressed the relations of the several classes are similar to those which prevailed in europe during feudal times and civilization is more backward than in india china or japan afghanistan is governed by an absolute monarch who is called the emir he has also another title which means light of the nation and religion he has an army of about one hundred thousand men and could make a strong fight in case of war he rules by many officials having large public offices here at kabul where we can learn much about the land and its people we find that afghanistan is a large country it is bigger than either france or germany and it would make about six states the size of virginia it is mostly mountainous the great range of the hindu kush running through it it has some rushing rivers and many streams some of which go dry in the summer the only cultivated places are in the valleys and upon the foothills and in little nests in the mountains most of the farming is done by irrigation and two harvests are often reaped in one year the first crop is sown in the fall and cut in the summer it consists of wheat and barley and some peas and beans the second crop is sown at the end of the spring and reaped in the autumn it is mainly rice millet and indian corn afghanistan has numerous orchards and fruit is so abundant that it forms the principal food of a large class of the people we see apples pears almonds and peaches sold in the bazaars and also quinces apricots figs cherries and grapes quite a large amount of preserved fruit is exported and much is laid away for the winter we are told that the country is rich in minerals and that it has iron gold copper and lead there are also precious stones of fine quality only small parts of the mountainous regions have been prospected and there are probably other rich mineral deposits of which no one knows but who are the afghans they look far different from the tibetans and most of the east indians they have straight eyes and light brown complexions some have rosy cheeks and not a few long silky beards many being descendants of the same race as our own the afghans are of several different tribes and they number altogether four or five million scattered here and there in villages and cities over the country we ask what these people do for a living and are told that they are chiefly engaged in farming fruit raising and in rearing cattle and horses they have also camels ponies and donkeys a few are employed in manufacturing they weave carpets and cloths of silk and wool and make shoes and other things of leather their exports include wool silk and tobacco and also drugs spices hides cattle and horses they import cotton goods indigo dye stuffs sugar and tea and also foreign wares of various kinds the trade of the country amounts to six or more million dollars a year our travels through afghanistan are on camels and ponies and we go nowhere without soldiers to guard us we see no foreigners for the emir does not usually allow them to come here 
and so far he has prevented the building of railroads he has been able to do this largely because of the location of his kingdom between the possessions of russia and great britain these two great powers are jealous of each other and in the past they have been glad to have a state like afghanistan so situated that it has kept british india and russian turkestan apart for the same reason they have not encouraged the opening of the land to trade and railroads this will probably be changed at some time in the future and the railroad systems of the russian provinces at the north and those of india at the south will be connected by a line across afghanistan when this is constructed one will be able to go almost the whole way from any part of europe to india by rail End of chapter 42chapter forty three of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b persia we are in persia today we have come south through baluchistan a dependency of india and then moved on westward we are now travelling along upon camels over a wild desert plateau cut here and there by great mountains from the snows of which are fed rivers which irrigate little valleys and patches of plain now and then we pass a salt lake and again we may travel for miles where the land is as sandy and stony as the desert of gobi this is the general character of persia it is a high plateau nearly level except where the mountains cut through it it is almost a desert and were it not for the mountains whose cold air squeezes the water out of the winds it would be altogether arid and sterile the country is large from east to west it is as long as the distance from new york to chicago and from north to south its width is as long as from boston to cleveland its area all told is three times that of germany and equal to about one-sixth of the whole of our union persia would make fifteen ohio's or kentucky's or virginia's or more than ten states the size of iowa illinois or wisconsin nevertheless it has only fifteen people to the square mile or about nine or ten millions in all the persians are not unlike the afghans they have light brown or yellow faces straight eyes and dark hair most of the men are bearded and have their heads shaved they wear great cone-shaped caps or turbans and long gowns which are tied in at the waist and fall almost to the feet under their gowns they have on very full pantaloons in the winter many wear furs as we move slowly along through the country we see comparatively few women these people are mohammedans whose women are not supposed to be seen by other men than their husbands the women live to a large extent in the back rooms of the houses and when they come out they are clad from top to toe in a long black or blue gown with a strip of white cloth at the front this strip is fastened on around the forehead and extends over the gown almost to the ground in the top of it just in front of the eyes is a window of fine lace through which the wearer can see as she walks along the street indoors the women wear divided skirts which reach to their knees and loose-fitting sacks with long sleeves they always have their own part of the house for it is a disgrace for them to meet any other men than those of their own families for this reason whenever a man is about to enter the home of a friend he is expected to stop at the gate and shout out some such words as woman away in order to give the women a chance to fly to their own quarters before he appears a persian does not ask after the wife of his friend and if he should be so impolite as to do so his host in replying would not refer to his wife by name or as his wife but as the mother of his children for instance if the persian's name were smith and he had a son named john he would not say my wife is well or mrs smith is well but i thank you little johnny's mother is so so today the persian women have but few rights the parents arrange all the marriages and girls are often married at ten and boys at sixteen or eighteen there are but few bachelors and not many old maids most of the persians live in cities or villages we see their towns as we travel over the country the villages are in or near the irrigated lands 
they are usually square consisting of dark narrow streets lined with houses each of which stands in a yard surrounded by high walls the houses are of clay stones or sun-dried brick those of the better classes being coated with mortar or plaster of paris the roofs are almost flat they are made by laying timbers on the mud walls and covering the timbers with brush upon which is put a layer of mud mixed with straw every summer a fresh coat of mud is spread on and as a result many of the roofs are a foot or more thick these houses have but little furniture the floor is the ground well pounded down with matting spread over it and sometimes over the matting beautiful rugs the floors of most homes form the tables and chairs of the family the people sleep there at night using no sheets and covering themselves with thick quilts in the daytime the bedding is rolled up and put away in a corner the cooking is done upon fires out of doors or in fireplaces the persians eat with their fingers and the plates of the poorer classes are sometimes thin cakes of bread when a man is through with the rest of his food he may eat up his plate and during the meal he tears off bits of it and by bending them in half uses them as pincers to convey the meat from the soup to his mouth the diet of the common people is largely made up of bread cheese and milk with a little soup or meat in the form of a stew once a day they drink a great deal of tea and some coffee outside each village are threshing floors places where the ground has been pounded and rolled until it is as hard as stone the wheat or barley is brought here from the fields and oxen are driven over it to thresh out the grain then the farmers take their wooden pitchforks and toss the grain into the air until the chaff has all blown away the straw is kept for stock feeding the chief business of the persians is farming and the rearing of stock the farms are irrigated by the streams from the mountains and canals for this purpose have long been in use the country produces great quantities of wheat barley and rice it has also large mulberry orchards which feed silkworms and it exports raw silk silk cocoons and silk stuffs many fine fruits are grown the first peaches mentioned in history came from persia and the country is celebrated for its excellent dates the sheep are of the fat-tailed variety many of which we have seen in our travels through asia they produce excellent wool from which are woven beautiful cloths and the finest of rugs persia has also donkeys camels ponies and horses as fleet as those of arabia much of the stock belongs to the nomads who dwell in tent villages and move about from place to place to find pasture the villagers drive their flocks and herds into their yards at night and take them out in the morning the milk of cows sheep and goats is universally used and they have an odd custom to make the cows let down their milk they believe a cow will go dry if it knows that its calf has been taken away and so after killing the calf they stuff the hide with straw and place it beside the cow at milking time but let us take a look at some of the cities of persia we shall first visit tehran the capital it is situated in the northern part of the country some distance south of the caspian sea and not far from a range of magnificent mountains whose peaks during much of the year are covered with snow many of them measure over two miles in height and away off at the east can be seen one which is more than seventeen thousand feet high tehran has some fine houses but most of the buildings are of sunburnt brick they are surrounded by walls built close to the edges of narrow streets through which canals run there are also many mosques with egg-shaped domes faced with tiles of bright blue and a number of large buildings devoted to the officials of the government and the colleges and schools the city is the largest in persia it has about three hundred thousand people other towns of considerable size are tabriz ispahan meshed and kerman which range from sixty thousand to two hundred thousand population tehran is especially important in that it is the capital and seat of the government it is here that the shah has his palaces and here parliament meets until nineteen o six persia was an absolute monarchy ruled by the shah who used the revenues as he pleased he spent but little towards developing the country and was often able during his reign 
to lay aside a vast portion in diamonds and other precious stones he had the power of life and death and many of his actions were very oppressive this continued until the beginning of the present century when the people began to object and in nineteen o six they forced the shah to grant them a parliament or national council which should fix the taxes and control all things of public importance this parliament was elected and persia is now governed by it under the shah so that the country may be called a constitutional monarchy the kingdom is divided into thirty-three provinces each of which has several districts there are governors over the provinces and lieutenant governors over the districts and in addition every town has its mayor besides the people so governed are several hundred thousand nomads who live in tents and move about with their flocks from place to place they are divided into many tribes each of which has its chief who collects the taxes and pays them to the general government we are told that persia is rapidly improving under the new government formerly its only schools were those connected with the mosques the teachers being the mohammedan sheikhs and the children were taught little more than to read the koran and perhaps how to write today the government is establishing new schools which teach the same studies we have and in some of which the children learn english a number of newspapers are now being published and many movements have been started to develop the country caravan and wagon roads are being laid out to connect the chief cities and in time will come railroads leaving tehran we take a long caravan trip during which we visit the city of tabriz the chief business center tabriz lies in northeastern persia not very far from mount ararat where it is said noah's ark rested after the flood the town is made up of a vast number of one-story and two-story buildings with larger buildings here and there scattered through it the houses are surrounded by walls built close to the streets and the streets are so narrow that we are often crowded against the walls to keep out of the way of the donkeys and camels which with great loads on their backs are continually passing through this way and that we spend some time in the bazaars they consist of little shops built along both sides of streets which are so roofed that the sun cannot come in the shops are much like those of india each merchant sits in a little cell walled with goods and he has goods piled around him he usually sits cross-legged on the floor and the customers stand out in the street as they shop there are no price marks the man charges as much as he thinks he can get and the buyer offers as little as he thinks he can make the man take the result is that it requires a long time to buy anything howbeit many of the articles sold are of considerable value and some are wonderfully beautiful this is especially so of the rugs for which the country has been famous for ages persian carpets were bought by the ancient greeks and during the middle ages they were carried to venice and from there over the alps into north europe persian shawls are also greatly admired and some are worth hundreds of dollars there are many rugs made in tabriz in one factory there we see a thousand boys weaving them in all sizes and of different designs the boys are paid about ten cents a day we visit also many smaller factories and find rug making going on in most of the villages the rugs are all made by hand and a fine one may require months of continuous labor a considerable part of this product is shipped to america end of chapter forty three chapter forty four of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b arabia or life in the desert we have traveled from tabriz southward through persia to ispahan another of its chief trading and manufacturing cities and from there have gone by caravan to bushir the chief port on the eastern coast of the persian gulf here we cross that gulf to bahrain arabia and on the way visit the pearl fishing grounds from which more than a million dollars worth of pearls are taken every year the pearls come from pearl oysters which live far down on the bed of the sea the shells are gathered by arab divers who plug their ears and noses with cotton and tie heavy stones to their feet 
in order that they may the more easily remain under the water each diver has a belt around his waist to which a rope is attached he carries a basket which he fills with the oyster shells he then signals by pulling on the rope and is drawn to the surface the shells are now opened and the pearls taken out we watch the divers a while and then go on to the mainland of arabia and make our way down the coast to muscat the chief city of the province of oman where we get a ship which carries us to aden most of our travels through western persia were in the desert we have passed over tracts in eastern arabia which were all sand and stone and our journey in the indian ocean has been along barren shores we are now in arabia lying at anchor in a harbor surrounded by low ragged mountains which are all brown rock and white sand there is not a green tree or blade of grass to be seen and everything is brown gray or dazzling white this is typical of a great part of this country which is one of the chief desert lands of the world the city of aden itself is all white and brown the houses are mostly one-story buildings of sun-dried bricks covered with plaster and on the outskirts climbing the hills are huts as brown as the rocks upon which they stand everything seems dusty and dirty the hot dry air from the desert sweeps over our ship it parches our tongues and as soon as we land we look about for a drink of cool water we soon find that water is worth money in aden and that every one must pay for all he gets it rains but seldom and sometimes two years pass without a drop falling there is only one well in the city and most of the water comes from the ocean the sea water being turned into steam which when condensed is fresh water the machines for doing this belong to the british government which has control of the city it sells the water to the people reserving a certain amount for the british soldiers who are stationed here as we walk through the town we see long caravans of camels coming in and going out they are laden with wool dates and coffee and we are told that two hundred thousand of them come here every year camels form the chief means of transport over the deserts and if we would travel over them we must ride on these beasts and have soldiers on camels to guard us but before we go farther let us take a look at arabia it is one of the least known lands of the world and much of it is still unexplored it consists of a stony sandy peninsula lying between africa and the main body of asia being separated from africa by the red sea and from the remainder of asia in part by the long persian gulf through which we have sailed it has a coastline of more than four thousand miles but the winds are comparatively dry before they blow over it and the rainfall is almost as scanty as in any large region on earth the greater part of arabia is a high plateau surrounded by mountains beyond which bordering the red sea and extending down to the water is a long narrow plain which is yemen is exceedingly fertile the southern part of the plateau is almost sterile but there are fertile patches in oman and farther north and in the interior vast tracts fitted for the grazing of camels horses sheep and goats in the past it was thought that the whole plateau was a desert but recent explorations have shown that perhaps two-thirds of it may be used for grazing or farming there are no large rivers but many wadis or river beds which for the greater part of the year although dry on the surface have water flowing below them these underground streams are reached by wells and the wadis therefore form the chief caravan routes a part of northern arabia and of the coast along the red sea is nominally governed by turkey much of the western and southern coasts are subject to the british the latter nation through its government of egypt controls the peninsula of sinai and several important provinces along the red sea and aden belongs to it outright most of the country however is independent being inhabited by tribes of bedouins each ruled by its chief many of the bedouins are tent dwellers but some inhabit cities and they have many villages of mud or stone houses scattered here and there over the mighty plateau 
the arabs number altogether eight or ten millions they come from the same race as ourselves although their life and habits in the hot deserts of arabia have given them a different complexion some being almost as black as a negro they are a lean race tall and well formed and on the whole fine looking they have straight black hair and black or brown eyes their faces are oval their noses aquiline and their eyes small and deep-set they are very proud but are polite good-natured and hospitable they seem to be distrustful of strangers and are ready to quarrel whenever occasion offers we may see arabs in aden and shall meet them everywhere as we travel over the peninsula here comes one now leading a camel his black face shining out in contrast to the white cotton gown which he wears his gown is open at the chest and bound round the waist with a girdle of leather he has also a goat's hair coat of black and white stripes which falls to his thighs and his head is covered with a bright yellow silk handkerchief tied on with a black woolen rope as thick as your thumb the rope is bound round his head again and again in such a way that the handkerchief covers a part of his forehead and neck and falls on his shoulders his feet are bare but they are protected from the hot road by sandals of wood behind the man walks a bedouin woman see how straight and fine-looking she is her face strange to say is not hidden and she is evidently proud of her necklace of silver and of the earrings of gold which half cover her cheeks her black face is tattooed her eyelashes darkened and her fingernails and toenails stained a bright red she wears a blue gown which falls to her feet and has a piece of dark blue cotton over her head other women we meet have on veils of various kinds and we learn that most of the women cover their faces when they go out of doors in some places they hide all but the eyes and in eastern arabia a thin black cloth serves as a veil the arabs are mohammedans whose women as we have already seen seldom go about with bare faces the inhabitants of arabia are divided into two classes those who live in tents and those of the towns and villages the tent dwellers are wandering tribes known as bedouins who live by rearing stock moving about with their sheep goats camels horses and asses from one grazing ground to another they are of many tribes each of which has its own district and is ruled by a chief they are the men of the desert and we shall find many of them also in the arid lands of syria farther north the bedouins are bold and as a rule are not friendly to strangers if we would travel with safety we must pay a tribute to the chiefs or sheiks to keep their subjects from robbing us and a powerful chief may send his soldiers along with us to protect our caravan from wandering bands on the way we stop now and then at one of the bedouin camps the tents are of homespun goat's hair or wool dyed black and woven into a coarse cloth by the women of the tribe the ordinary tent is seldom more than twenty feet long it is usually divided by a curtain into two rooms one for the women and children and the other for men there is but little furniture the ground serves as the table chair and bed of the family the cooking is done over open fires and all eat with their fingers millet and dates form the principal food the millet is ground between stones to a flour and made into cakes the dates come from the date palm of which there are many varieties they are eaten also by the horses and camels and even by dogs some of the tent dwellers raise a little wheat and barley but millet is the chief crop there are many children in these little tent villages they watch the flocks play with the horses and colts and roll about on the sand the babies are naked and the girls and boys wear no clothing until they are quite large we see children as old as ourselves who have on almost nothing their skins are dark brown or black and they shine under the tropical sun which is so hot that we feel like throwing off our clothes and playing as they do of all the stock kept by the bedouins the camels are most interesting and especially the camel colts which are still with their mothers they are ungainly little creatures and when we chase them they run off at great speed the bedouin boys tell us that some camels are slow and some fast there are riding camels and freight camels the riding animals are for travelling they make six or more miles an hour 
and some will go seventy-five miles in one day the freight camels are used to transport goods over the country they go about three miles or less in one hour but each will carry three hundred pounds camels are especially fitted for work in the desert their stomachs are such that they can store away enough water at one drinking to last for a week and are therefore able to traverse the long distances in these sandy wastes where no water is to be had arabian horses are among the finest known to the world and the best of them are produced in the province of Najid on the central plateau the arabian horse is not as large as the average american horse and we have many race horses which can go faster than any arabian these horses however are so beautifully formed and are so noted for their kindness endurance and other good qualities that every one wants them they are usually gray in color although some are chestnut sorrel or black reared in the desert they become accustomed to go long distances without water and it is said that a desert-bred steed will travel a whole day and night in the summer and about twice as long in the winter without either water or food we find that the bedouins think much of their horses they keep them staked near their tents and allow them to run about everywhere they treat them so kindly that they seldom become vicious the children are allowed to play with them and they are really made a part of the family the horses are ridden with halters being guided this way and that by a pressure of the knee End of chapter 44chapter forty five of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in an arabian village mecca and medina today we shall see something of the cities and villages of arabia the cities are small most of them small settlements along the coastal plain of the red sea and in oman at the southeastern end of the peninsula by far the largest are mecca and medina in western arabia these two cities were the homes and chief preaching places of the prophet mohammed and for that reason are considered so holy by the mohammedans all over the world that they go there to worship in crowds every year we shall first visit the villages they are to be found in such places as contain considerable tracts of cultivable land they are everywhere of much the same character the houses are seldom of more than two stories and the most of them of but one story only they are built of mud bricks or of stones put together with mortar they have flat roofs and are often surrounded by walls each village is cut up by winding streets and it has a market-place in the centre about which are the shops where the people come together to trade the shops are often kept by women and but little else than food is sold in them but suppose we pay a visit to a high-class arab his house is exceedingly rude although it is somewhat better than that of the average native there are no windows facing the street and the door is so low that we must stoop to go in entering we come into the gentleman's parlor where all male guests are received if we should stay overnight we may sleep in this room on the floor our host is well to do and his home has some furniture the floor is covered with rugs and there are cushions here and there upon which we sit in oriental fashion with our legs crossed at one end of the room is the fireplace where a brass coffee-pot steams as soon as we are seated our host claps his hands and a servant offers each of us a cup no larger than half an eggshell it is filled with a brown fluid so thick that it looks more like molasses than coffee the steam rises as the coffee is poured from the pot and we blow it a little to cool it we then sip it slowly enjoying the delicious aroma this country is one of the homes of the coffee plant and the famed mocha which is considered about the best of all coffee on earth comes from a city of that name in yemen arabia we find our friends hospitable and remain with them until evening as the night approaches dinner is served and we sit down around the meal on the floor the food consists of thin wheat cakes baked to a crisp in an oven and a stew of camel's flesh 
at great feasts a sheep or lamb may be roasted and this is brought in whole to the guests we eat with our fingers picking the meat out of the stew with pieces of cake which we double up for the purpose when we have finished the stew dates and other fruits and sweets are brought in and after that a basin of water is passed round and every one washes his hands now a boy brings a covered bowl in which incense burns he sways this about each guest in order that he may perfume his face hands and clothes we have no wine at the meal the arabs are mohammedans and they do not believe it is right to drink anything which intoxicates as we go on with our travels stopping at one village after another visiting with the people in their tents and houses we come to like them very much they are cleanly as to their persons they bathe often and take such care of their teeth that they shine out like rows of ivory made whiter by the darkness of their complexions we observe that the men and boys shave their heads and that they wear fez caps or large turbans the arabs have bright minds although the schools are few and not many of the people can read or write the teaching is mostly confined to the koran or mohammedan bible and the sheiks or the priests are the teachers nevertheless a long time ago the arabs were among the most learned men of the world they had the best doctors and were famous as astronomers and mathematicians it was they who introduced the study of algebra into western europe and for a long time they were noted for their geographical knowledge but suppose we take a look at mecca where mohammed was born arabia as we have already learned is altogether a mohammedan country it was long the seat of the mohammedan religion and mecca as the birthplace of their prophet is still holy to the many millions of that faith they consider it so sacred that whenever they say their prayers they kneel down with their faces towards it and this is so whether they be in java china india africa or in any other part of the world indeed mecca is considered so holy that strangers are not allowed to visit it and it is only through those who have gone there in disguise and described it that we know much about it it is a town of fifty thousand or more lying in the interior of the country almost seventy-five miles east of the red sea one way of reaching it is by the port of jidda from where the people go in by camels or on foot and another is by a railroad which the mohammedans have recently built from damascus down through the desert by the way of medina the great site at mecca is the sacred mosque which contains the kaaba a little building in its centre which is supposed to be especially holy and also a black stone which according to their tradition fell down from paradise when adam was thrust out of the garden of eden the mohammedans believe that when they kiss this stone their sins pass away as their lips touch the rock they tell us that when the stone fell to earth it was whiter than snow but that having been kissed by the people through so many generations their sins have gone into it and turned it jet black the character of the stone shows it to be of meteoric origin and we know that there are similar ones in other parts of the world medina where mohammed was buried is much less than mecca in size and is not considered so sacred it is surrounded by a wall forty feet high but the streets are narrow and dirty and the houses are flat roofed and of two stories only the tomb of the prophet lies inside a great mosque which covers a space of almost three acres End of chapter 45chapter forty six of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b asiatic turkey in palestine and mesopotamia our next journeys are to be devoted to the many curious countries of asiatic turkey including syria mesopotamia armenia and asia minor lying west of persia and north of arabia and bounded on the north and west by the black and mediterranean seas these countries comprise a territory more than ten times the size of the state of ohio and some parts of them are thickly populated they have altogether about sixteen million inhabitants 
including many different peoples and tribes there are turks arabs syrians greeks armenians and jews all of whom we shall see as we go on with our travels asiatic turkey is governed by the sultan who lives at constantinople in europe and who rules it through the governors and local officials the land is one of mountains and tablelands with several valleys and plains of wonderful fertility it has some large rivers such as the euphrates and tigris which have been famous as far back as man can remember it was in the valleys of the tigris and euphrates known as mesopotamia that the ancient cities of nineveh and babylon stood and many men think that there was the place where the tower of babel was started baghdad of which we have read so much in the arabian nights stands on the tigris and in the western part of asiatic turkey are damascus and jerusalem and the lands of the bible if we should cross arabia by caravan to mesopotamia and visit baghdad we should find that it is still a thriving city with bazaars much the same as when harun el rashid ruled there and did we go down the tigris and the euphrates we should travel through many rich irrigated farms including some of the largest date groves of the world the date palms number hundreds of thousands and they annually yield enough fruit to give every man woman and child in our country three pounds and leave some to spare the fruit is picked from the trees and packed up in bags or wooden boxes in which it is sent to bazora the port at the head of the persian gulf and from there to the united states to europe and indeed all over the world we shall find it much easier however to continue our journey northward through the red sea and the suez canal to port said on the mediterranean from where almost every night ships sail for jaffa in palestine the journey is a short one and when we awake in the morning we are at anchor in front of a ragged white and gray town built upon the rocks on the very edge of the sea we have trouble in landing for the water is rough but we finally get to the shore where we take the railroad train for jerusalem which lies about forty miles distant in the judean mountains the ride is delightful we first go through the orange groves for which jaffa is famous and then cross the flat plains of sharon where the philistines live we next climb the mountains passing over the country where samson was born and farther on see where little david had his fight with goliath the plains of sharon are fertile and the grass is as green as that of our country in june the sides of the roads and the borders of the fields are covered with great beds of poppies the flowers of which are as big as the palm of one's hand and as red as fresh blood in some places the farmers are ploughing they wear white gowns and turbans and use ploughs made of two sticks of wood fastened to a yoke which rests on the necks of the camels or donkeys the farmer holds the plough with one hand and carries a long goad or stick with the other with which he pokes up the beasts as they travel the furrows as we climb the hillsides we see many shepherds watching their flocks of white sheep and black goats and in some of the wheat fields see girls picking out the weeds known as tares it takes us about an hour to reach the country where the israelites lived and the road then winds in and out among rocky mountains we pass groves of olive trees and climbing ever higher and higher at last arrive at the little plateau upon which jerusalem stands we are now about twenty five hundred feet above our starting place at jaffa on the edge of the sea and in front of one of the most famous and interesting places of the whole world before we enter jerusalem let us take a bird's eye view of palestine we knew that it was a small country but we did not realize how very small it is on the average palestine is not more than fifty miles wide and it is just about one hundred and fifty miles long were it level a high-power automobile could cross it in one hour and if the road ran lengthwise one might start at eight o'clock in the morning at dan which lies at the north in the foothills of the lebanon mountains and by noon he could be at beersheba at the extreme southern end and on the edge of arabia the country is so small that standing on the mount of olives outside jerusalem one can if the day be bright 
see the mediterranean on one side of him and the dead sea and the jordan on the other the land is for the most part a low mountainous range covered with limestone and much of it is so barren and rocky that it cannot be cultivated on the east is a deep valley in which lie the dead sea and the sea of galilee connected by the winding river jordan and on the west is a narrow coastal plain another plain or valley crosses the country from the lower end of the sea of galilee to the mediterranean the jerusalem of to-day is large it contains altogether eighty or ninety thousand people more than half of whom live inside a great wall which runs around most of the town skirting the edges of a little plateau the walls are of yellow limestone taken from the quarries near by they are beautifully made rising to the height of a four-story house on three sides of the plateau the ground slopes from the walls down into valleys at an angle so steep that it is almost impossible to climb up except on your hands and knees the fourth side of the city faces the plain we can see that a place so situated could be easily defended and that this was one of the reasons why the israelites chose this site for their capital but let us take a look at the city inside the walls the space is covered with box-like stone houses built one on top of the other in all sorts of shapes the houses are crowded along narrow streets which wind this way and that above them here and there rises the spire of a church and in one corner are about thirty-five acres where stands an immense building with a green dome of bronze that is the mosque of omar it is on the site of solomon's temple and under it scientists suppose the ruins of the temple to be in the centre of jerusalem high above the mass of stone boxes may be seen another great dome it crowns the church of the holy sepulchre and is supposed to cover the spot where jesus was crucified it is there that pilgrims from many parts of the world come to worship and there is kept the marble tomb in which as the oriental christians believe the body of jesus was laid we are surprised at the meanness and squalor of jerusalem it is made up of narrow streets walled with houses more closely packed together than those of any other city of the world the buildings are swarming with people there are families of jews greeks and armenians each living in one room so small indeed that it would be thought hardly large enough for a bedroom in america many of the rooms have no windows and some are like vaulted caves and are lighted only at the front most of the buildings are walled floored and sealed with stone sometimes they are built around courts upon which the rooms open and in such cases the people often cook in the courts because there is no space left inside the house the roofs of these jerusalem houses are flat and not a few of them are covered with grass at night they form the loafing places of the families and in the summer the people sleep there we see no chimneys the fuel most commonly used is charcoal which makes but little smoke but let us take a walk through the streets we shall find them quite as queer as the houses in some places they are like tunnels being roofed over by the second stories of the buildings and walled on each side by what seem to be long lines of vaulted caves these caves are shops or stores which open right out upon the street they are not large enough for the customers to enter and hardly big enough for the turbaned merchant to turn around inside them indeed it looks to us as though jerusalem might have been made by the descendants of the cave dwellers this cave-like character prevails also in the villages of palestine many being cut out of the hills which form the back walls of the houses what a variety of faces we see on the streets there are men here from all parts of the turkish empire there are pilgrims by the thousand from russia and greece and visitors from every country of christendom let us climb to the roof of one of the houses and look down on the crowd which passes below that dark-faced bearded man in a long brown and white gown with a yellow handkerchief covering his head is a bedouin we can see the black rope tied round the kerchief and he reminds us of the camel guards we had in arabia next to him is a shepherd from bethlehem in a coat of sheepskin below which a white gown falls to the feet he has his daughter with him and we see that her face is as fair and her features as regular as our own 
she wears a gown of red and green silk and has on a cap covered with rows of gold coins that cap contains her dowry and it shows how much money she will bring to her husband when married as we look little droves of donkeys laden with grain pass beneath us and men from the desert come in upon camels there are also many russian pilgrims on foot the men wear long coats and trousers and boots which come to the knees the women are clad in short gowns and high boots there are also armenians and greeks some of whom wear clothing like ours some have skull caps of red felt known as the fez and others wear turbans we see christians from abyssinia with faces like jet and men from northern europe with cheeks as fair as our own there are also many mohammedans but it is impossible to tell who they are for their dress does not indicate their religion there are some however whose faith we cannot mistake i refer to the jews they have olive brown faces curved noses and their features are usually strong the men all wear beards and two long curls of hair one of which hangs down in front of each ear they wear cloth gowns or coats that come almost to the feet and many of them have caps bound round with a fur that sticks out like the quills of a mad porcupine the jewish women wear bright colored dresses and shawls upon which flowers are embroidered or printed we can tell them also by their bare faces the mohammedan women being always veiled when they go out on the street leaving jerusalem we take horses and ride all day to the eastward over the hills to the valley of the jordan we descend into the valley and follow the course of the river to where it empties into the dead sea we are now on the shore of the lowest body of water on earth the dead sea lies thirteen hundred feet below the level of the ocean and it has no perceptible outlet its waters are far more salty than the ocean containing so much mineral matter that if you should boil down a tumbler full one-fourth of the contents would be found to be salt they are so heavy that when we go in for a swim we find that we cannot possibly sink we bob up and down like a cork and if we move our feet seem to be thrown to the surface the dead sea is not large its length is only forty-seven miles and its width not more than ten climbing back up to jerusalem we make our way northward through a hilly country into samaria and thence to galilee to visit nazareth where the boyhood of jesus was spent it is a little town in the mountains surrounded by green fields and beautiful flowers we enjoy ourselves a while there playing with the children who are noted for their beauty and then go on eastward to the sea of galilee we stop on the way to visit the spot where jesus is said to have preached the sermon on the mount and then have the fishermen take us out in their boats the water is now smooth and the scenery delightful we remain a day at tiberius and then cross the sea to the railroad on which we ride to damascus end of chapter forty six chapter forty seven of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b travels among the turks damascus is one of the oldest cities of the world its origin is not known but it was a thriving commercial centre in the times of abraham and david it is an oasis city lying on the edge of the syrian desert in a large tract of fertile soil which is irrigated by two rivers from the lebanon mountains it now has several hundred thousand inhabitants and its vast bazaars are filled with fine goods we visit the shops and make excursions into the country near by looking at the great orchards of oranges lemons and figs we watch the caravans of camels coming in from persia and elsewhere and later take the railroad for a trip over the mountains to the thriving mediterranean port of beirut from beirut we steam northward to smyrna a commercial centre with many greek citizens and then go through asia minor into armenia and other parts of asiatic turkey we observe that the country has much wasteland it has some forests on the mountains and is rich in minerals but only a few good mines have been opened the chief business of asia minor is farming 
but the tools are of the rudest description most of the crops are cut with a sickle and near each little town is a threshing floor upon which the grain is trodden out by oxen or donkeys the farms are usually small and the owners are compelled to pay the government a part of the crop in many places the soil is exceedingly fertile producing grain of all kinds as well as cotton tobacco and opium about smyrna and elsewhere are orchards from which quantities of fine figs are exported to america and europe and we find oranges olives almonds grapes and nuts almost everywhere we can buy smyrna figs in our grocery stores in the mountains are mulberry groves and the people rear silkworms and export their cocoons they also weave many fine silks asia minor is noted for its excellent wool the plateaus are covered with a rich grass upon which large flocks of sheep and goats are fed this is the home of the angora goat whose wool called mohair is about the finest known we watch the people of the villages weaving the goat's hair and sheep's wool into rugs just as we saw them doing in persia they work in their homes on rude looms before which they kneel or sit cross-legged several are often employed upon a single rug each taking a section of the pattern the fine rugs are made entirely by hand the tufts of wool being tied together and fastened to the threads without the aid of the shuttle such rugs are as soft as the best of our machine-made carpets and their colors are better a good workman can weave only three or four square inches a day and a hearth rug of the best quality requires months of continuous labor but let us visit some of the farm villages the farmers live in little houses of stone or sun-dried brick the roofs are flat and the windows are mere holes in the walls in armenia the houses are often built either wholly or partly under the ground an excavation is made in the side of a hill and the building is so erected within it that one can hardly tell it is there unless he sees it from the front such houses are usually of one story and their flat roofs are often covered with two or three feet of earth on which the grass grows there are no fences about the roofs and the cattle and sheep may be seen grazing on the very tops of the houses the floor is often below the level of the ground and we have to step down to get in upon entering we find a cow stable on one side and on the other a room which forms the kitchen parlor and sleeping place of the family it is cold in armenia during the winter and these cave-like homes are easily warmed the village people have but little furniture the possessions of many a family consisting of only a straw mat which covers the floor a rude chest for the clothes a few copper vessels and some stone water jars the cooking is done over open fireplaces or in ovens of clay or stone the meals are served on the floor and fingers take the places of knives and forks the cities of turkey have some large and comfortable homes there are many rich and well-to-do people in whose houses there are separate quarters for the women and men the men guests never being admitted to those parts where the women live in the better class houses the quarters of the women are often guarded by servants the women are not allowed to go upon the street without so concealing themselves in blue or black cloaks that they look as though they were walking about inside so many balloons in addition to these garments the woman covers her face with a veil so thick that her features are hidden indeed a boy may pass his mother on the street and not know her and a man could hardly recognize his wife if he saw her out shopping while at home the women wear jackets and very full trousers their feet are either bare or clad in slippers of soft bright colored leather turkish gentlemen usually wear shirts and full pantaloons and over them gowns which reach from the neck to the feet in the cities some dress as we do the poorer classes and those out in the country have only full trousers and a jacket much like a roundabout the trousers are tied at the ankles and the men's shoes are without heels and turned up at the toes the jackets are often embroidered with silver and gold the turks are cleanly as to their persons and the men and boys have their heads shaved with the exception of a lock on the crown they wear skull caps or turbans which they keep on while in the house 
the boys and girls do not come together at parties and the men and women are always apart husbands and wives do not eat together all marriage arrangements are made by parents who often make the engagements when their children are still babies boys are usually married while in their teens and as the girls approach twenty years of age they are considered old maids these people are not very well educated but new schools are being started and now there are several thousand scattered over the empire the mohammedan priests are often the teachers and the mosques are sometimes the schoolhouses in such schools the boys sit on the floor holding their books on their knees or in their hands they have no desks nor chairs they study out loud swaying back and forth as they sing out the verses they are trying to commit to memory the chief studies are the turkish language and the koran or mohammedan bible they also have some arithmetic geography and history almost every man knows how to read education is free and the schools are under government control the laws provide that all children must be educated but in many districts such laws are not enforced and the people are ignorant within recent years however great changes have been going on in turkey the government is being reformed and the taxes reduced railroads are planned to open up the most important parts of the country and in time many improvements will probably be made for ages turkey has been an absolute monarchy ruled by the sultan but a few years ago a parliament was elected and from now on the people will make their own laws and to a great extent govern themselves. End of chapter 47。Chapter 48 Geographical Reader Asia by Frank Carpenter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Russia in Asia, Transcaucasia, Turkestan, and the Steppes our last journeys are to be in the vast provinces of asia belonging to russia of all nations the russians are the largest landholders they own about one-seventh of all the land upon earth and their possessions in asia cover more than one-third of that continent siberia is one-third greater in extent than the whole of the united states including alaska and the russian provinces which lie south of western siberia and north of afghanistan persia and turkey have altogether an area equal to one-half that of our country these vast territories are for the most part thickly settled the southwestern provinces are largely made up of deserts and northern siberia is as cold and bare as northern alaska the countries are so vast that we shall travel rapidly over them stopping only at such places as have to do with the commerce and work of the world we begin our explorations in transcaucasia a beautiful little country which is bounded on the north by the caucasus mountains it is only about four times as large as the state of pennsylvania but it has over eleven million people and is by far the most thickly settled province of asiatic russia the soil is rich producing grain cotton rice and tobacco and such fruits as grapes figs peaches and almonds the people are of several races and we meet everywhere georgians armenians and russians the georgian men wear long robes pantaloons high boots and cone-shaped caps of black wool their robes are belted in at the waist they have rows of cartridges upon their breasts and pistols in their belts many of them carry swords and they impress us by their fierce looks the georgian women are so beautiful that the richer turks come here for their wives indeed there was once a regular business of buying and shipping these girls to constantinople but this is now contrary to law although some are still sold and smuggled out of the country these women have fair rosy complexions black hair large eyes and white teeth they are slender with small hands and feet most of them can dance well and many play upon the tambourine and guitar they wear gowns much like those of our country but their headdress consists of a small round cap over which is thrown a white silk or lace handkerchief tied under the chin we start at batum on the black sea and from there go by rail to baku on the caspian the road runs through the mountains passing tiflis the capital a large and well-fortified city 
at batum we see many tank steamers loading petroleum on the railroad we go by long trains of tank cars and at baku find ourselves surrounded by huge oil tanks tall derricks and great pumping works which remind us of the oil regions of california texas or pennsylvania the land here is underlaid with beds of petroleum and there is a vast industry in raising the oil and shipping it to russia and other parts of the world the russian oil although by no means so abundant as ours is our chief competitor in the foreign markets much of it is carried in tanks or in pipes to batum and thence over the black sea into the mediterranean whence it goes to the various countries of europe asia and africa at baku we find a steamer which takes us across the caspian sea and lands us on the opposite shore where we get the trans-caspian railroad which carries us more than a thousand miles eastward into the heart of central asia both the engines of the steamer and those which pull our cars use petroleum as fuel we travel for miles through deserts visiting now and then an oasis or fertile spot where the land is cut up by irrigating canals and where every drop of water is saved to feed the dry soil we pass through kiva and bokhara little countries ruled by kings or emirs subject to russia the people are tartars and they look not unlike the turks they are chiefly farmers raising wheat rice barley cotton tobacco and silk we find delicious peaches melons and grapes the railroad takes us through vast fields of cotton whose product is now competing with ours in the markets of russia we see also wandering tribes who have flocks and herds of goats sheep horses and camels they dwell in round tents which they move about to the best feeding grounds they have also cities and villages this region was the original home of the turks from where they moved westward to the mediterranean sea there are several other races in bokhara however and on the whole the people look very strange caravans of camels bring loads of freight to the stations and we see men riding about on horses and camels the villages and cities are dirty and squalid the houses are made of mud bricks and even the railroad stations are mud we visit the oasis of merv and crossing the great river amu go on to bakara and samarkand through a fertile irrigated country cut up by countless canals the land rises as we journey on toward the east we reach the pamir which is one of the highest countries of the world and then move northward over a plateau through russian turkestan on our way to siberia our train takes us by tashkend on to the great body of salt water known as the aral sea and thence across the kirghiz steppes where we meet the tartar herders and shepherds who form its inhabitants they are known as kirghiz they are one of the nomad races of asia numbering more than three millions their country is about one-third as large as russia in europe the kirghiz have vast herds of camels sheep horses and cows they dwell in circular tents covered with felt and move about from one pasture field to another they are proud of being stock breeders rather than farmers these people remind us of our american indians and also of the tartars north of the great wall of china they have high cheekbones small oblique eyes and skin the color of copper both men and women wear yellow or red leather trousers and over them a long robe much like a dressing gown the trousers and robe are tied in by a belt at the waist in addition to these garments the women have a close-fitting shirt they are fond of jewelry and paint and powder their faces braiding ribbons and horsehair into their hair to make it seem longer the kirghiz have many odd customs girls are usually wedded at fifteen or younger and the groom has to pay for the bride giving her parents a certain number of sheep horses or camels before the marriage takes place a poor and rather homely girl is often sold for one or two camels but a beautiful rich one may bring as much as fifty camels or one hundred sheep among these people the wife does the most of the work she puts up and takes down the tents and loads them upon the camels when the tribe moves to a new feeding ground she aids in watching the stock and is expected to do all the milking this is a great task for not only the cows but also the sheep goats and mares are milked 
the cows sheep and goats are milked only morning and evening but the mares are milked three times a day one of their chief dainties is kumis which comes from mare's milk it is a liquor made by putting the milk into a leather bag and keeping it there for about two weeks during which time it is frequently shaken it soon ferments producing a drink which tastes somewhat like buttermilk but which will intoxicate one if he takes over much end of chapter forty eight chapter forty nine of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b russia in asia siberia we are travelling this morning on the great trans-siberian railroad we reach it at chelyabinsk a station which is sometimes called the western gate to siberia it is situated on the eastern slope of the ural mountains being surrounded by groves of birch trees it has railroad shops round houses for engines and manufacturing establishments a few hours after our arrival we bought tickets for vladivostok and return and we are now coming back from a trip over this the longest continuous line of railroad in the whole world the road is more than five thousand miles long and with its asiatic and european connections many thousand miles longer it extends from the ural mountains to the pacific ocean and from harbin manchuria a branch line goes south to mukden and to dayren on the yellow sea the latter is sometimes called the chinese eastern railroad it connects at mukden with the railroads of china and korea so that one can now go by the trans-siberian to peking or to fusan on the lower end of the korean peninsula from where a few hours by ferry will put him on the japanese railroads the trans-siberian railroad is one of the chief trade routes of asia it carries to europe much of the tea silk and other products which were formerly transported by sea it has many passengers for by it one can go from peking to london in less time than you can cross the pacific and besides there is no seasickness to fear our journey is comfortable the train carries first and second class compartment cars which have excellent beds we have a dining car whose tables are supplied with fresh fish from the pacific ocean and from lake baikal and the many rivers we cross we have excellent butter and eggs from the farms near the stations and also beef pork mutton and chicken as well as venison wild duck and other kinds of game going eastward during the first part of our travels we cross a cheerless plain spotted with salt lakes and marshes the steppes of western siberia here the country is much like that of the kirghiz which we have just left we stop a while at omsk on the Irtish river and thence ride on to tomsk on the ob river both are small but fast-growing cities inhabited by russians they have fine homes and good stores and are centers of trade crossing the ob on a bridge a half mile long we travel more than eleven hundred miles farther to Irkutsk on the angara about two hours from lake baikal here in almost the center of southern siberia is another large city with banks stores hotels libraries and schools the place is lighted by electricity and its streets are wide and well paved we stop over a train to fish in lake baikal it is one of the deepest bodies of fresh water known it is twice as large as lake ontario and more than half again as large as lake erie the country about is covered with forests but east and west of it are vast plains some of which are already settled by farmers there are extensive grasslands and great fields of wheat there are many villages of log cabins put up by the russians who go out from them to their work in the fields we are told that they hold the lands in common and that the elders of the towns divide the various tracts among the people year after year we find more settlements as we go eastward and at vladivostok see the chief russian seaport on the pacific it is a slice of russia in asia containing a mixed population of about fifty thousand russians it has a regiment or so of russian soldiers and also many koreans and chinese the streets are filled with long-bearded men wearing black caps thick coats and full pantaloons which are stuck inside their high leather boots 
we ride about the town in droshkis drawn by black horses which gallop like mad we do not speak russian and we motion the drivers which way to go we visit the chinese and korean parts of vladivostok and now and then meet one of the aborigines or natives descendants of those who were the only inhabitants of siberia before the russians came they look much like our eskimos having copper-colored skin slant eyes thick lips and flat noses among them are the buryats from about lake baikal the latter are full of superstition and when one of them dies they kill a horse in order that its spirit may carry him safely and comfortably through the land of the hereafter they are fond of tobacco and we see children of eight or nine years with pipes in their mouths equally odd are the tunguses who come from the valley of the amur and parts farther south most of them are hunters who roam through the woods without tents dwelling in caves or hollow trees they have reindeer and they travel from one part of the country to another on sledges they are fond of the animals and rear them for sale vladivostok is one of the seats of government of siberia it has many officials who know all about the country and from them we learn much concerning these vast regions which have been so little explored the land as a whole is an irregular plain which slopes from the highlands of asia towards the north ending at the arctic ocean this plain is made up of three great belts the first along the edge of the ocean is bleak and treeless and is frozen for the most of the year it is swampy in summer but during the winter the arctic ocean freezes for hundreds of miles from the shore and one might ride there for days over the snow without knowing where the land ended and the sea began this is the home of the reindeer polar bear and black fox it is the land of long days and long nights where during midwinter there is nothing but darkness and where the midsummer is one long long day when the sun never sets south of this icy region is a belt of almost impenetrable forest filled with wild boars wolves and other fur-bearing animals here are found sables worth more than their weight in silver and ermine whose beautiful white skins were formerly used to line the cloaks of kings the third belt is that through which we have been traveling in many respects it is like our far northern states or the wheat belt of western canada its winters are long but in the summer the nights are so short that the crops have enough sunshine to make them mature this belt contains rich farming land and it is being gradually settled as we have seen from the many villages and towns through which we passed on our journey the climate is healthful and it will some day support many millions of people the officials we meet tell us that the resources of siberia are by no means confined to its farms the land contains all sorts of minerals in almost every district gold is known to exist there are valuable mines of gold quartz in the altai and ural mountains and along the northern coasts thousands of men are at work digging up the frozen land and melting it with fires to wash out the gold nuggets weighing as much as a quarter of a pound have been found and the grains on the average are larger than those of any other part of the world siberia has plenty of coal and there is one iron mine in the ural mountains which is said to contain about two billion tons of fine ore the country has silver copper nickel and lead and salt and petroleum as well the forests of siberia are extensive and valuable and its great rivers the ob yenisei lena abound in fine fish indeed it is almost impossible to appreciate the wealth of this great land and to think what it may become in the future we conclude our travels by returning to chelyabinsk from where we get a direct railroad line to moscow and warsaw from warsaw a fast train takes us to paris and we spend a day or so at the french capital after that we travel across the english channel to london thence go to southampton and one of the largest of the ocean greyhounds brings us over the atlantic to dear old new york End of chapter 49 End of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Asia, by Frank Carpenter